In our last video, we talked about the historical aspects of German Expressionism and how that paralleled the historical aspects of the New Hollywood movement as well as the making of Star Wars. In this video, we'll be exploring the main visual technique popularized by the German Expressionist called chiaroscuro, with a follow-up video examining how that technique has been utilized throughout the Star Wars films. So to begin, let's ask the question, what is chiaroscuro? Well, if you've never heard of it before, it's really a somewhat simple concept. By utilizing a single light source, you can create a contrast of light and shade on your subject. When used at a 45 degree angle in photography, this is sometimes referred to as Rembrandt lighting, referring to the Baroque artist of the 17th century. In video and film production, this technique is also commonly known as low key lighting, with high key lighting being its opposite. As you might guess, this lighting technique is rather pervasive within film, since it's far more difficult to remove shadows in the real world than it is to create them. Though, what makes Kiroskiro so interesting is the emotional effect that it can create within the viewer. The German Expressionists were all too eager to exploit this fact, often using high contrast lighting to increase the emotional tension within their films. And while the German Expressionists are known for popularizing chiaroscuro within cinema, the etymology of the word dates back to the Italian Renaissance of the 15th century. Chiaroscuro is a portmanteau of the Italian words chiaro, meaning light, and scuro, meaning dark. The term was used to describe the modeling technique popularized by the artist Leonardo da Vinci, who used chiaroscuro to imbue his paintings with four major qualities. For one, chiaroscuro can be used to create a sense of volume and dimension within a painting, which in turn gives them their sense of realism. By emulating the real world through realistic lighting and shading, da Vinci also imbued his works with a sense of naturalism. At the time, humanist depictions of the physical world were seen as a popular rejection of the flattened and abstract depictions of heaven created by the Italo-Byzantine style, which had dominated the last two centuries of the medieval era. Chiaroscuro's balance of light and dark also imbued da Vinci's work with a sense of visual drama and intrigue. This, perhaps more than any other trait, is arguably what gives them their enduring popularity. Though this brings up an important question about the nature of chiaroscuro. Why does this lighting technique seem to have such a gripping effect upon us? There's two reasons that come to mind. Obscuring what is seen, and thus what's known, can create feelings of danger or mystery. As the saying goes, the fear of the unknown is often what scares us most, though its discovery could be just as tantalizing. Or, as Joseph Campbell once said, it is by going down into the abyss that we recover the treasures of life. Secondly, the contrast between light and shade in chiaroscuro harkens to the concept of the shadow self, an idea popularized by famed psychiatrist Carl Jung. The shadow is the parts of our persona that we hide away from our conscious everyday awareness. This discarded aspect bubbles out from our unconscious in unexpected and often negative ways. It's only when we face our shadow in the light that we're able to bring unity to our psyches. If this concept sounds familiar, it's because it's the basic psychological idea behind the light and dark side of the force. Luke has to wrestle with his shadow self throughout the original trilogy in order to rescue his father from the dark side and bring balance to the force. Interestingly, this psychological effect of chiaroscuro is particularly emphasized in the works of the artist Caravaggio, who arguably mastered the technique a century after da Vinci popularized the concept. Not only are the paintings of Caravaggio filled with violence and intensity, but the dramatic aspects of their lighting have seemingly been pushed to their limits. The chiaroscuro of Caravaggio is sometimes called tenebrism, which is a more dramatically intense version of the chiaroscuro practiced by da Vinci. This deep conflict between the light and dark aspects of Caravaggio's paintings are actually reflective of his own psychological struggles. You could say that Caravaggio was like the Kylo Ren of the 17th century art world. He was an artist torn apart by the light and shadow aspects of his own persona. While his body of religious works helped to modernize the Catholic Church during the Counter-Reformation, his personal life was marked by street brawls, drunken benders, hedonism, and even murder. His paintings were reflective of this conflicted psyche, showing scenes that allude to his self-indulgence and violence, but also to his belief in the devout and to the Catholic faith. For instance, let's take a look at Caravaggio's The Calling of St. Matthew. Like many other Counter-Reformation paintings, the clothing of the characters are of a modern 17th century design. The tavern's dirt-laden window is notably dim, with the light appearing to emanate from an unseen source in line with Jesus' halo. The subject of the painting is the bearded tax collector Matthew, who is posed as if to say, who me? 
still transfixed in their coins, there are two other tax collectors, who some have argued represent younger versions of the more wizened Matthew to their right. And then there's the two boys, one facing Jesus and the other turned slightly away. The boys are perhaps symbolic of Matthew's fundamental decision, to continue his life as a tax man or to follow in the path of Jesus, though they could also reflect Caravaggio's own psychological dilemma, to continue his life of destruction or to follow a more righteous path. The lighting facilitates these themes and symbolic gestures with a sense of gravitas that can still be felt today. Between the chiaroscuro of da Vinci and Caravaggio, what seems to persist is their sense of realism and naturalism, as well as their ability to create intrigue and dimension. But how does that change when you take the technique of chiaroscuro and place it in a physically real medium, like filmmaking? Given the darker aspects of Caravaggio's paintings, one might assume that filmic chiaroscuro was merely an outgrowth of German Expressionism's darker storytelling. And while that's partially true, it's not quite the whole story. For instance, some of the most popular films within Germany during the years before the war were international features that came out of Denmark. Many of those films had already introduced the technique of chiaroscuro to German audiences prior to the country's international film embargo in 1916. Around the same time, the Berlin stage director Max Reinhardt was using chiaroscuro in lieu of his usual extravagant sets due to the shortage of supplies caused by the war. Max Reinhardt's stage productions were among the greatest attractions of the day, and many German Expressionist filmmakers were directly influenced by his creativity. So, like many other Weimar-era film techniques, the use of chiaroscuro in German Expressionism ultimately boiled down to its established popularity among the German people. Still, the German Expressionists were some of the first within film to turn chiaroscuro's usual sensibilities on their head. While the chiaroscuro of da Vinci and Caravaggio highlighted the natural world with a sense of accuracy and realism, the strange and unnatural lighting of German Expressionism aimed to do quite the opposite. By using light and shade to accentuate the inorganic set designs and otherworldly characters typical of the movement style, the German Expressionists aspired to generate what they called stimming, or mood. Stimming was more than just a visual concept though. It was said to connect the viewer to the quote, vibrations of the soul, which could be found as much in people as it could in places and things. This expressionist chiaroscuro also played a more symbolic role, creating abstract expressions of reality that could reveal their deeper truths. For instance, let's look at an example from 1922's Nosferatu, directed by F.W. Murnau. By abstracting Count Orlok's physical form into a kind of stalking shadow clinging to the world around it, Murnau gives us a truer and more sinister expression of this moment. The fact that this distorted shadow is also inherently flat subverts one of the other traditional qualities of chiaroscuro, that is to create volume and dimension within an image. The two-dimensional silhouettes of German Expressionist characters like Cesare, the Golem, and Mephisto also subvert this natural quality of the technique. So if realism and naturalism aren't its main goals, what can we say is the essential role of this new Expressionist chiaroscuro? Perhaps the best answer comes from the film theorist Lottie Eisner, who wrote what is essentially the sacred texts of the German Expressionist movement. In her book titled The Haunted Screen, Eisner writes that the Expressionist does not see, he has visions. Facts and objects are nothing in themselves. We need to study their essence, rather than their momentary and accidental forms. It is the hand of the artist which, through them, grasps what is behind them, and allows us to know their real form, freed from the stifling constraint of a false reality. In other words, Expressionist Chiaroscuro sets out to create a vision of reality that is in essence truer than what a realist depiction can offer. This idea of realism's false reality is really quite interesting when you think about George's original concept for Star Wars. George wanted to create what Akira Kurosawa called an immaculate reality, a fictional world brimming with the same kind of physical realism that the German Expressionists sought to subvert. So how does Chiaroscuro play out across the Star Wars trilogies? To answer that question effectively, we'll need to break down the lighting on each of the Star Wars films. In the next video, we'll reveal some of the unexpected ways that Curescure has been utilized across the Skywalker saga, and hopefully come to a deeper understanding of this integral lighting technique within film. If you like this video, leave a like and consider subscribing to the channel for future Star Wars and film theory breakdowns. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you on the next one. I want skating lessons. Son, you know, once you start, there's no going back.